Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Today we want to educate you on a major dividing point in space exploration. Should we focus on the moon first, or Mars? And why must we choose between the two? We will first play a lesson on the advantages and challenges of the moon, and then introduce you to a new channel called Mars Matters. Mars Matters is run by a very talented gentleman who is dedicating himself full time to his science education channel. Please visit his channel after today's lesson and don't forget to subscribe. Now I will let Will introduce himself and we'll present some of our viewpoints on the challenges that lie ahead as humanity starts building outposts on the moon and Mars. Hi there, I'm Will from Mars Matters. If you're interested in humanity's future in space, or curious about the colonization of Mars, you should check out my channel. My recent videos were on subjects like, why did we stop going to the moon? How can we get to Mars? And should the moon or Mars be the focus of our colonization efforts? I want to thank the professor for the introduction, and I'll be seeing you after class for some extra credit. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. There is a lot of hope right now about humanity's future in space, and a lot of hype. If we just read the titles, we would think that warp drive is just around the corner. On the other hand, we often hear those who seem to practice what we call pessimistic fatalism, explain how everything we want to try has been tried, and not only did it fail, but it can't possibly succeed. How no human being can long survive the effects of low gravity, or the radiation exposure spaceflight will subject us to. While we agree that these are serious problems, none of them are without a solution. We choose to navigate a path we call optimistic realism. That means we accept as a guiding principle that humanity can expand into the solar system and survive with the proper technology. We have lessons on radiation exposure and shielding, and artificial gravity, by the way. But despite these difficulties, at some point, we need to just get the job started. What would we do first if the Academy had a few billion dollars? We would first focus on the moon, as this will be humanity's testing ground for centuries to come. But we would not start by sending people to the moon. People are fragile and expensive. What would we send instead? Give us access to one starship to take 150 tons into orbit. Getting from low Earth orbit to the moon requires a delta V of about 4,100 meters per second. Assuming a specific impulse of 380 seconds from methane-fueled vacuum engines, giving us an exhaust velocity of 3,727 meters per second. It will cost us 100 of those tons to do the translunar injection and lunar orbital insertion burns needed to get us into a stable low lunar orbit. We now have 50 tons in orbit around the moon. From there it will take at least 1,870 meters per second of delta V to land on the moon. That gets us to the surface with a little more than 30 tons. Assume that the lander had a mass of 10 tons. What would we send to the moon? a nuclear-powered, remote-controlled piece of heavy equipment. Let's look at what we could build. This is a Caterpillar D5 bulldozer. It has a mass of a little more than 19 tons. Variants of this machine have been working on Earth for decades. We would want to strip away every piece of unneeded equipment and anything that might not survive in a vacuum and replace it with something more advanced. We can add computers, telemetry, cameras, lights, and sensors for lunar operations, as well as an excavator arm, robotic manipulation arms, and a solar furnace. We would modify the hydraulics to operate in vacuum, and we would of course remove the oxygen breathing engine, and replace it with a powerful electric motor. Does this sound crazy? Something similar has already been done. This would be our Pathfinder design. 
This is a nuclear lunar rover called Lunacod. Lunacod was built by the Soviet Union in the 1960s. The first one landed on the moon on November 17, 1970, and was deployed the same day. It was brought to the surface by a Luna lander, and was operated by remote control from Earth. Unlike Mars, the moon is close enough for direct remote control. A five-person team of operators was able to drive the Lunacod with about a five-second response feedback delay. Lunacod had a mass of about 840 kilograms. It was 1.35 meters tall, 1.6 meters wide, and 1.7 meters long, about the size of a very small car, but shorter. It had eight wheels, each under independent control, and two forward and two reverse speeds, topping out at 100 meters per hour. The latest record set by the rovers on Mars was 245.76 meters in one day, set by the Perseverance rover on the 5th of February, 2022. Perseverance could go faster than this if it wasn't limited by auto navigation. Communication with Mars is much too slow for remote control. It would take at least 40 minutes from when you turn the wheel to know if you missed the rock. The Lunacod used a fast decaying radioactive material called polonium to provide heat for Lunacod. Polonium can be made by bombarding bismuth with protons. One gram of polonium-210 can generate 140 watts of thermal power. This didn't require a reactor. Polonium decay spontaneously produces heat. The Soviets decided to save mass and use solar energy for electrical power, limiting driving operations to the lunar daytime, which I like to call day -lune, and using the heat of the polonium to keep the machine alive during the long lunar night, which I like to call dark moon. Radio thermoelectric generators and nuclear reactors can be very heavy and had too much mass for this mission. I would like to see Stirling engines used with this system. We have a lesson on these very efficient generators here. The Perseverance rover uses plutonium for both heat and electricity. Plutonium is extremely rare and can be used to make an atomic bomb. While the Perseverance uses an RTG, we would want to use a uranium-based small nuclear reactor, similar to the 320 kilogram Topaz-1 reactor, also built and flown by the former Soviet Union. Two of these reactors were purchased by the United States in the 1990s for only $13 million. This reactor used 96% enriched uranium oxide to produce five kilowatts of electricity. We would combine three of them to give 15 kilowatts of continuous power for less than one ton of mass. We would use solar panels also and a solar reflector. We would use our rover to scoop up regolith and filter out the fine powder. The larger pieces would be melted down to form a large plate. These would be held and positioned by the robotic arms, while a device similar to a powder-fed 3D printer would be used to seal them together and start building a structure. The first thing this machine would build would be a large landing pad to give those fragile humans a safe place to come down. It could then be used to start sealing off the bottom of a small crater, building a large circular habitat around the inside edge, then using the blade to push regolith on top for radiation shielding. We could also use electricity to melt the regolith and electrolyze it to release oxygen. Lunar regolith is on average over 40% oxygen. This oxygen would be combined with aluminum to make aluminum oxide glass. This could also be melted into large panels and sealed along the front of the habitat. The humans would then land on their safe metal pad, bringing inflatable interior modules with attached airlocks and additional radiation shielding. Inflatable furniture will work fine on the moon where our weight is only one-sixth what it is on Earth. What is holding us back from accomplishing something like this? Access to resources and the will to risk them. All of these technologies have existed for over half a century. No human lives have to be placed at risk. The moon is our proving ground, just a few days away. Waiting for us to prove that the obstacles that held us back in the past can and will fall to our technology today.
something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And there are links to the Lunacod rover and Topaz reactor in the description. Stay safe. And here is Will making his argument for Mars first. The moon lacks meaningful amounts of carbon, hydrogen, and other elements important to life and civilization. Whereas Mars has every required element in abundance, all in easily accessible forms. Like Earth, the moon and Mars are primarily made up of oxygen and silicon. Silicon has many important uses, from increasing the quality of steel to making transistors and solar cells, but many of these applications require carbon and manufacturing hyper-pure silicon for use in electronic devices requires both carbon and hydrogen. Carbon is virtually non-existent on the Moon, and hydrogen only exists in very small quantities. This means lunar colonists will need to import raw materials to efficiently produce quality steel, biomass, and solar panels. On Mars, steel will be commonplace, and settlers will be able to build a self-expanding solar power network entirely from Martian materials. Another useful element is oxygen, which is needed for breathing and to make rocket propellant. Since oxygen makes up 60% of the Moon by weight, it's often thought that it will be plentiful on the Moon, but harvesting it isn't easy. Currently available methods include melting lunar regolith at temperatures greater than 1,600 degrees Celsius and running an electrical current through it. Maintaining such high temperatures is complex and, like growing plants in artificial light, energy intensive. Considering SpaceX's Starship uses almost 1,000 tons of liquid oxygen for a single launch, an easier way of acquiring oxygen on the Moon will be needed. On Mars, oxygen can readily be acquired from the CO2 atmosphere, or from water, and there's enough of both to serve a growing settlement's needs practically indefinitely. Water ice has been discovered at the lunar poles, but only in small quantities in difficult to access locations, so using it for oxygen would be costly. On Mars, as a global average, 14% of the surface is water ice, and pure water ice glaciers can be found not too far from the equator. Millions of times more water exists on Mars than on the Moon, so relatively simple soil baking or ice melting technologies will be able to provide ample amounts of water on Mars. Although Martian settlements would initially require imports from Earth, in the long run Mars has by far the best potential for self-sufficiency. The Moon, however, would always require imports from Earth. So, what do we have to gain from supplying these imports? Having all the elements needed for a robust manufacturing industry, a Mars base could supply expeditions to the asteroid belt and beyond with tools and equipment too heavy to be transported from Earth. It could provide a resupply of propellant, water, and even food, being the only other location in the solar system suitable to grow crops for export. Asteroids contain trillions of dollars of valuable material, which Mars is extremely well positioned to access. 90% of so-called near-Earth asteroids actually orbit closer to Mars, and Mars itself orbits right on the edge of the main belt. Due to longer travel times to Mars, tourism is less likely than on the Moon. However, Mars is by far the better candidate for long-term or even permanent human habitation. So there will be a large demand for housing, which private and public companies can compete to supply. Mars is an ideal location to search for extraterrestrial life, as it was once a warm and wet planet and contained all the conditions needed for life as we know it to exist. In the long term, Mars can be terraformed to have liquid water oceans, a thick atmosphere, and plants growing unaided on the surface. Mars alone has what it takes to support a fully self-sufficient second branch of civilization and humanity could help it become a new home for life to evolve on even long after we are gone. It's for these reasons that we're preparing our next great leap into space. The Moon's closer, but Mars is larger, with stronger gravity, more resources, and an atmosphere to protect from solar radiation and micrometeorites. Considering the familiar day-night cycle and reasonable temperatures, Mars has prime real estate compared to the Moon. The Moon's proximity does make it more accessible, but Mars isn't exactly inaccessible. Under the right conditions, rockets can actually send more cargo to Mars than to the Moon, and a human trip can be accomplished in six months with existing technology. The best it gets on the Moon is at the poles, where there's plentiful solar power, but you'd have to live underground and mine water ice from frigid craters. On Mars, you could live anywhere on the surface, with all the water and resources needed for life and civilization. 
there's less sunlight for solar power, but that doesn't take as much energy to grow crops and meet other basic needs. Besides, Martians will be able to manufacture solar panels and create a self-expanding power base, while lunar colonists will rely on imports to make efficient solar cells. The Moon's ideal for space-based manufacturing, astronomy, and tourism, and will help us to test our technologies and access the solar system. But its proximity to Earth means it will forever be subject to earthly politics, which makes it too close to be a true backup for humanity. Due to its hostile environment and minimal communication delay with Earth, the Moon is well suited to be developed robotically where possible, in preparation for the scientists and tourists who will want to go there. Mars, on the other hand, is a place where humans can live and multiply to large numbers, a place where an actual civilization and not just a mining or scientific outpost can be developed. Only Mars is a viable target for true colonization. We learn more by considering the opinions of others than we do by just arguing our own. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to Mars Matters. And stay safe at Astro Proterra. Caguia heads south on the south side of the South Polican Basin. This is a gigantic impact basin with a diameter of 2,500 kilometers. Now, Antoniadi Crater comes into view. This crater is 143 kilometers across, with an unusual rim consisting of two rings. Caguia's observations have revealed that Antoniadi's interior is the deepest point on the moon. <laughs>